Right, so uh, good afternoon here from Singapore. Good morning to people joining us from Europe, like Emmanuel. Um, we have people joining us today for this uh, webinar on advancing ASEAN's circular economy agenda from uh, right across the globe. So from Europe and then right across Asia and down to Australia and New Zealand as well. Uh, I'm Chris Humphrey. I'm the executive director of the EU ASEAN Business Council, which is the, uh, the only, in fact, cross ASEAN business body for European, for European businesses. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome here today our esteemed panel. Uh, our panel uh, will be moderated uh, by Corrado Fortulati, who is the Director for Sustainability Services at KPMG here in Singapore. Uh, he's also doing a lot of work with Eurocham here and a lot of work with us, helping us on a, a paper we did uh, a few weeks ago on financing ASEAN's future. Um, developing cohesive and responsive policies for sustainable finance. And our panel today consists of Emmanuelle Marie. She's the head of unit for sustainable production, products and consumption at the Directorate General for Environment at the European Commission. And the core activity of that team is to support the transition to a circular and green economy within the European Union. We're also joined by Kwok Wai Chung, who's Deputy Director Cluster Development, Industry Development and Promotion Department at Singapore's National Environment Agency. Um, part of the role there is to facilitate uh, capability development for waste management and cleaning for enterprises in Singapore. And Wai Chong is also involved in the Clean Enviro Summit in Singapore, which is a global platform for knowledge and business exchange on innovative clean environmental solutions. From our members, we have Rachel Fleischman. She is the Head of Sustainability and Advocacy at BASF for East Asia. Uh, her work there furthers and localizes BASF's global commitments in the areas of zero carbon growth, circular economy, human rights, and delivery of sustainable solutions to customers across a wide range of industries. And last but not least, we have Olivia Wyden. She is Associate Director, Corporate Affairs and s and for Pernod Ricard in Asia Pacific. She supports the group's advocacy and sustainability and responsibility functions in the region, leading Pernod Ricard's new 2030 SNR roadmap in Asia, and in charge of furthering and localizing the implementation in order to deliver on the group's strategic purpose in that area. With that, I will hand over the reins to Grado, who will be leading the discussion with our panelists today. And uh, I think uh, for, for the audience who are attending, you're all on mute, your cameras are off. If you have questions to ask, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to type your questions in, and Corrado and I will help to uh, sort them out from there. So with that, I uh, will be handing over the host controls to Corrado, and have a good discussion, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you, everyone, from joining from all around the world. So I think we, we have 138 registered wow. participants, and people are still coming in. So I'm very happy to see that. So on behalf of, of the AU Asian Business Council, uh, the panelists, and myself, a big thank you for taking the time to join this webinar. Um, uh, very shortly about myself, uh, so after uh, more than 20 years in banking, uh, in November last year, I was welcomed by KPMG to join a very uh, passionate and super skilled team in Singapore, but also globally, uh, looking at sustainability and here under then circular economy. Uh, when I was invited by Chris to join as the moderator, I was actually thrilled about the idea of, of being able to to uh, moderate the discussion with some brilliant minds. Uh, and I will allow uh, any one of you to, to introduce yourself shortly before we start the discussion. Uh, but just to give you a little bit a sense of the discussions uh, for, for today, uh, so that we make a good um, use of the hour, uh, we will probably have 40, 45 minutes of discussion, and then we will open up for Q&A. Uh, I think when I, when I was invited and I was looking at the headline, uh, uh, I, I like the fact that we are using advancing Asian circular economy and not advanced uh, mm. Asian circular economy because it, it actually indicates that this is a journey. Uh, it's not really a, a, a destination. There is nothing, it's something in the making 
Uh, and in the making um, is, is really a journey of collaboration. And, and that's why I'm very happy to see that we have Emmanuel and Wei Chong actually representing the public side. And then we have uh, Rachel and Olivia representing the private side. And I think that this is a good combination for having a very strong uh, discussions on, on the collaborative nature of circular economy. Uh, I think as well, uh, we had a questions before we started that I, I, I think is, is good to have in mind when we are discussing it. Uh, circular economy is not only about environment. Uh, I think it's, it's a lot more about innovation, it's a lot more about smart industries. Uh, and I think this is an important uh, clarification to be made at, at this stage. That when we are looking at circular economy, we're looking for mindset, we're looking for behavior, we're looking for stewardship we're looking for innovation. We are not necessarily only looking at, at the waste, at, at the end uh, side of the cycle. Uh, so without any further ado, before we are deep diving into our uh, engaging uh, discussion, then can I ask Emmanuel just to say a few words about yourself and then we take it, uh, we will start our discussion first with the public and then we go to the private. So after Emmanuel, Wechang, if you can, Say a few words about yourself and then Rachel and Olivia. Thank you. Thank you, Corrado, and good afternoon to uh, everyone. Uh, so I work uh, in Brussels for the uh, European Commission and the European Commission is one of the uh, institutions of the uh, European Union. And we have uh, different uh, roles. One of them is to make a uh, proposal, proposal for strategies, proposal for uh, legislation as well, that becomes uh, then uh, EU law. And those proposals and strategies are made to the uh, 27 member states of the European Union and to the European Parliament uh, that ultimately uh, decide for the uh, 500 million uh, citizens of the uh, European Union. We have other uh, roles in order to support international uh, action, to manage uh, the uh, EU budget. And so it's in this uh, context uh, that I represent the uh, European Commission uh, on the circular economy to explain what is the agenda uh, of the uh, European Commission, what we are proposing uh, in uh, Europe for the forthcoming uh, five uh, years. We are just at the beginning of a new uh, political mandate. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen is heading the European Commission uh, since uh, last year. Uh, so I think it's also very important to, to take this into account that we are at the, at the start of a new mandate, building on, uh, on what has been uh, already done on circular economy. Uh, but uh, this is the, the, the point we are in, in the journey uh, to the circular economy, because indeed it is a journey. Thank you, Emmanuel. Wei Chong, please. Hi, hi. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to our friends uh, in Europe. So I come from the National Environment Agency. So uh, under the agency, we cover the almost everything, nearly everything, agencies, some people like to call it. So uh, we take care of the air that uh, you, know, you breathe when you're born and until the, even the after-death services. That means we also take care of the cremation and uh, we also run some uh, columbariums. So for NEA, our key focus is actually to ensure the clean air, clean land, clean water and a high standard of public health for our citizens in Singapore. And under the clean land, uh, that's where the waste management comes about. And I'm from uh, the waste management sector all my career for the last 30 years or so. And uh, quite passionate in this area, in this field, and um, also on the lookout for new technologies and new ways that we could actually uh, treat the waste better, uh, not to move it around so much, to reduce uh, um, you know, uh, reliance on manpower. Because as you know, uh, during this COVID season in Singapore, we, we can't really get uh, even the people out there to work in this sector. So therefore, um, my role in the, the industry development and promotion department is also to build up the capabilities of our local waste management companies who provide all the services for Singapore, as well as for all the cleaning uh, companies in Singapore. Uh, we used to provide these functions as NEA itself, but uh, since the 90s or so, these uh, functions have been outsourced to the private sector. 
So currently, our private partners are providing all these services for Singapore. And my department's role is to ensure that they are uh, resilient enough with uh, capabilities built up and uh, prepare them for a future economy of Singapore. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So if we're moving into the private sector, uh, Rachel, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Rachel Fleischmann. I had regional advocacy and sustainability for German chemical firm BASF uh, in Asia Pacific. Um, and during my career, I've, I've spent time in government, in nonprofit lobbying, and in business. So I've been on all sides of this table in this discussion. Um, I'm also co-chair of the EU ASEAN Business Council Sustainability Committee, um, and in that capacity, contributing to a forthcoming paper on circular economy along with Olivia. Um, and um, that's all I'll say for now. Look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Rachel. Olivia. Thank you, Corrado. Um, so similar to um, Rachel's role, I work with Perna Ricard. We are um, a French wine and spirits company. Um, in Asia, we're based across 15 markets. And really, um, on the SNR or sustainability side of my role, I'm working with our 15 Asian markets to implement our 2030 SNR roadmap. Uh, within those 15 markets, it's really a diverse group, and three of them are production sites. So we have production sites in Myanmar, India, and China. So really looking at a sustainability and responsibility strategy that covers a range of markets and also a diversity of the types of um, structures that we have in those markets. Thank you, Olivia. So if, if you like the, the idea of circular economy being a journey, let's start the journey by having some definitions. So if we can start from the public side, Emmanuel, can I ask you to, to define uh, and explain what circular economy actually means to the European Union? Um, so for us, it means moving from a linear economy where we produce, consume and uh, throw away uh, to a circular economy where we keep uh, the resources for as long as possible uh, in the economy and we minimize uh, waste. Uh, we see it really as, um, as a growth uh, strategy, as uh, a way uh, to support uh, innovation for greener products, green uh, markets, um, but also to, uh, in conjunction with, with this, to, to help uh, fighting uh, climate change and to reach our goal of uh, climate uh, neutrality by uh, 2050 as one of the key uh, policies uh, to reach that uh, climate neutrality in the second um, context of the Green uh, Deal, which was adopted by uh, the European Commission in, um, in December last year. Uh, we see that the rate uh, of um, uh, resources uh, used has tripled in the last um, years. It will double again uh, by uh, 2060. This is generating 90% uh, of the um, biodiversity uh, loss of water stress and 50% of the climate uh, change emissions. Uh, we see also that in the European uh, Union, our waste are growing, and we have this figure of 70% uh, increase of, of waste by 2050 and that there is an opportunity uh, to do better because for the moment uh, we uh, produce only on the basis, almost exclusively on the basis of the use of uh, virgin uh, raw materials 88% of the time and only 12% of the feedstocks come from uh, recycled materials. So we, we see that there is an opportunity and we, we see an opportunity for systemic uh, change uh, that can uh, continue on the basis of the first circular economy action plan that was adopted uh, in 2015 until 2019. Now we have a new uh, circular economy action plan that has just been uh, adopted. Uh, 
So systemic change, I would say, towards a circular economy at large. Yeah, and Emmanuel, on that circular economy action plan, can you please share what are the key pillars and, and deliverable uh, that, that are expected? Yeah. So in, uh, in the new uh, circular economy action plan, we uh, list uh, 35 uh, actions uh, that we propose to the European Parliament and to the to the Council for the forthcoming years. So there is a policy document and an annex to that policy document with uh, the 35 actions. And they are um, not only about waste, uh, because we see that we need to act along uh, the loop and starting by uh, product. We believe that uh, we need to do uh, more uh, to uh, support the development of uh, green uh, product, of green markets, of green business uh, models, and to do away with uh, products that uh, break, that cannot be repaired, uh, on which we have no information on the environmental impact. So, we would like to propose uh, a new a revised legislation uh, on the eco-design uh, of uh, product uh, in order to, to enhance uh, the, the markets for these green products. Then we believe that we also need to act at the level of the consumption to empower uh, consumers um, to be in a position to choose a greener product and to make sure that when they buy green, they are confident that what they buy is, um, is green. And so uh, fighting misleading uh, claims, but also restoring uh, a fair level playing field between companies uh, on the claims uh, they, they make will be another um, pillar of our action also trying to incentivize public authorities uh, to buy green. So buying green is not only you know, the final consumer, but it can be in the B2B uh, relation and also uh, for uh, public authorities. In the action plan, we have focused on a, a number of uh, key value chains where we believe there could be a big potential for higher circularity it has been the, the case for packaging and will continue uh, for uh, plastics and it will continue to be to be so but we see also opportunities for ict electronics textiles construction uh, batteries and vehicles uh, for example so we are very much interested in working with uh, stakeholders uh, on um, on this waste will remain an important pillar of the um, circular economy we need less uh, waste for the moment. I think that each citizen in the European Union uh, has uh, 500 kilos of uh, municipal waste every year, 173 kilos of plastic uh, uh, packaging, all packaging included uh, produced. So clearly we cannot continue like, like this. We need to also um, manage in a better way our exports of, of waste and ultimately make sure that we have, uh, we use the value uh, of, uh, of waste and put it back uh, in the economy, supporting the, the use of secondary uh, raw uh, material. So this is a comprehensive agenda. It will take time to put it in place and each of the action will be uh, discussed on its own merit in the forthcoming uh, years. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. If I, if, I can, uh, if I can ask you a personal uh, uh, reflection, how, how, how can this circular economy action plan um, help um, globally, but even more since the, the uh, headline of this webinar is Asian, uh, what, what, what do you think could be practical um, actions or assistant points? Uh, where where the the um, circular economy action plan from uh, from AU can actually help uh, Asian to drive to to advance in the circularity. 
Actually, what, uh, what is very clear is that, uh, you know, the European Union uh, will uh, not succeed a, a transition to a, a circular economy uh, on its own. So uh, this is why we have dedicated a lot of attention to the um, external uh, dimension, to the global uh, dimension. And uh, we make a number of um, proposals uh, to reinforce um, action uh, globally, for example, with uh, towards a global agreement on, on plastics, um, setting up a global circular economy uh, alliances where we could uh, team up with uh, other uh, governments uh, to, um, to bridge the knowledge gaps, for example, and to have more partnerships uh, initiatives. Um, we also see that we need to reinforce what we have already started, for example, with the circular economy uh, missions uh, between uh, European Union delegation with businesses, uh, NGOs, policymakers, meeting, uh, for example, in Indonesia in uh, 2018, uh, in Singapore, Malaysia in 2019, and probably uh, more uh, key uh, partners in the years to, to come. And then supporting also specific programs on, you know, rethinking plastics, uh, fighting marine litter. Uh, so we are very much looking towards, um, you know, teaming up uh, with uh, Southeast Asia. And it's clear that uh, the business uh, council in, and, and chambers of commerce and businesses in that context have, you know, the opportunity and we also the responsibility uh, to uh, to promote uh, that uh, transition. So you are really uh, greatly uh, placed uh, to to make it um, happen. Thank you. If I can move to Singapore and uh, Wai Chong, ask you what what. What is circular economy in, in, in your definition? So for Singapore's context, uh, circular economy is uh, similar to the Europeans' uh, the concept of uh, changing it from a linear economy to one that's also a circular. In a in sense, we are closing the loop. So we have done uh, similar things for our water. If you know our water, you, know, you get it from the, the, the sky, the rain, then you use it, and then you throw it, and you dispose it, and it goes away. So we have actually closed the loop for the water, where we collect every drop of rain that drops in Singapore, and as well as uh, even the sewage that comes out of the houses. We grab all this, and then we reuse it, uh, re reprocess it to, into drinking water for the citizens. So in that sense, that is the circular economy for the waterfront. So now we're trying to do the same thing for the waste management fund. So in the uh, in the last couple of years, uh, Singapore has actually started off with our waste management in a linear manner. You know, we collect the waste from the households and uh, all these are actually then brought to our landfills and then it's closed. Yeah. And, uh, and we know that uh, Singapore is a very small island, so we don't have enough resources in that. So that, by that, gave us the uh, impetus to look for a solution. And uh, we came across waste to energy. So now we have the waste going to a waste to energy plant, it is treated and we get the power out of it and only about 10 or 15% of the remnants goes to our landfills. Uh, we only have one landfill la uh, left in Singapore and this is an offshore landfill. So, and uh, circular economy to us is actually uh, to actually change the whole linear cycle to one that is we uh, take the resources, we make it into some product and with this product, it is used by the consumers. And after it's used by consumers, it's now recycled into something that goes back into the making process again. So for our waste management side, it's the same thing. Uh, after we have taken the waste, we have treated it, and it goes into our waste to energy plant. And then after that, the, the ash goes into the landfill. So now we are looking at how we can reduce even the ash that's going into our landfill because this will be a future challenge for us. We don't have enough land for another landfill. Yeah. So can I ask you just to clarify uh, for the one that may not be familiar with the, the, the uh, master plan in Singapore, 
uh, what are the pillars of the master plan and, and also how similar they are to, to the European one? So the master plan that you're talking about is actually our zero waste master plan. Correct. So this zero waste master plan is uh, also uh, following the circular economy approach. So in a sense, we're looking at the circular economy, uh, the components of it, how we are adopting this into our waste management cycle. So for the, the zero waste master plan, this was actually um, uh, carefully crafted in partnership with uh, industry, uh, other governments and even stakeholders, uh, non-government organizations to co-develop this master plan. And for this master plan, before it's launched, there was a lot of um, uh, even high level uh, signature uh, signaling of our intentions that we want to drive Singapore towards being a zero waste nation. So we actually had our minister to launch and announce that uh, 2019 will be the year towards zero waste. And then sometime in uh, August, uh, we then launched the master plan. And also to push this master plan along, we also came up, uh, we had a bill that's tabled related to this. And inside this master plan, it has uh, three key pillars. And this looks at the sustainable uh, production, starting from the front. Uh, how are we able to produce with less materials and resources needed? And the second pillar is on sustainable consumption. So this sustainable consumption looks at a pattern of the people, how we are able to use uh, product as long as we can, repair it as much as we can, reuse it as much as we can, share it as much as we can. And finally, it looks, uh, the third pillar looks at sustainable uh, resource management. And that looks at our the treatment plants, how we are able to uh, get the most material out of the, the materials that ended up as a waste in the waste stream. Um, a question to Emmanuel and yourself before moving on to the private sector. COVID-19, how do you see COVID-19 impacting some of those plans? Um, what, what is your take? Uh, is it a challenge? Uh, do you see hurdles in, in how COVID-19 and, and maybe what comes after COVID-19 in terms of our own behavior and... and um, well, I see challenges and I see opportunities. So in terms of challenges, COVID-19 had actually uh, impacted the way we uh, collaborate and we communicate. Even this webinar is an, uh, an example of what happened with the COVID-19. We're not able to gather together. And in terms of logistics, I think there's a major impact on logistics. Of course, a lot of our products in Singapore are actually imported. Uh, initially, we thought that the COVID would only affect our tourism, our transport industry. But later on, when the, the situation developed and most of us have to work from home, we realized that along with uh, quarantine restrictions from countries, we see that there's a restriction in the movement of materials in terms of logistics. And there's also a restriction in the terms of um, uh, people moving around. So we can't find people to actually carry out the cleaning services, the waste management services, even though the companies are able to, uh, they want to provide the service, yet they don't have enough people to actually go out there to collect the waste. So with this, it's now making us look at um, what can we do uh, to prepare ourselves after when the situation improves. So one of the things that came up was actually food security. So um, we are going to ramp up our food production uh, to produce at about 30% of Singapore's needs by the time we reach uh, 2030 or so. Because currently, most of our food is actually imported and they are also imported from many sources. And uh, we see that we also need to diversify our markets um, where we are getting some of these imports coming in as well as exports. And of course, for the waste management front, there will be a lot of impact on our uh, movement of recyclable materials as well as import of new materials for the production. Thank you. Rachel, moving to BSF, uh, one of the, uh, the leader in the chemical uh, field. How, how, how is circular economy uh, and thereby the way you're looking at it from a, from a value chain uh, and resource perspective, uh, how, how big a team is it for BSF? 
how big a team. <laughs> <laughs> um, those of us who have sustainability in our titles um, don't usually have the luxury of doing just one thing. So I do climate and circular economy and palm oil and occasionally batteries and, you know, sort of whatever, whatever's in the headlines that day. Um, but it's really, it's really a holistic effort. Circular economy is really challenging us to rethink the way we think. Uh, the way we produce and the way we we interact with our value chain partners and I, i'm actually glad that you worded the question like that because a lot of my professional time i spend trying to get people to think around value chains and then i give them homework and then we do the homework together you know really laying out what all the steps what all the nodes are in the value chain and then looking at the the waste the water the emissions the impact on biodiversity et cetera, et cetera, at every step of the way and then trying to see how we, through processes or products, can try to minimize that, that, that uh, negative environmental impact or maximize a positive one. And usually it's environment, sometimes it's social, but usually it's environmental. So this whole value chain way of thinking is quite important. Um, and we actually have quite a large suite of tools um, for measuring these different impacts all along the value chain. We developed them to make sure that each of our successive generations of products was getting better, you know, that we could prove to ourselves we were making progress with our innovation, but we're finding more and more that our customers are asking for this data as well. So it's not just carbon footprinting, it's really all of these different elements and we're able to break it down for them at each step on the value chain. We actually did the, our own homework of analyzing over 60,000 of our own products um, and, and categorizing them according to how well they contributed to our customers' industry's sustainability. So automotive or packaging or energy or food or textiles. Um, and those, those sort of superior ones we call accelerators, um, the ones that really help our customers in meaningful ways, um, were 28% of our revenue last year, a little bit more. Um, and our board has set us quite ambitious targets <laughs> for growing that number. Um, and that's really where, where most of our innovation dollars are, are going. Um, but we recognize that we're just one node on that value chain, um, and so we work with, through the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and with other players uh, in the new plastics economy and elsewhere to try to figure out the business models that we can marry up to the materials um, to make this all work. And it's, it's a huge puzzle, but it's some of the most exciting work going on right now. Yeah, and, and uh, actually, uh, Rachel, if I should um, make a, a reflection and a and, and, uh, and a question to you, because you are among the largest producer of plastic, right? But you are, you are, you are also the founder of the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. Um, how to read it? What's, what's the take? Well, so BSF is one of the largest chemical companies in the world. So our chemistry is found in, in as I mentioned, almost every value chain you can think of in every industry. Um, textiles, renewable energy, construction, automobiles, electronics. Um, a lot of what we do is invisible in the final product. So we used to have a tagline, we don't make the products you buy, we make the products you buy better. And that, that really explains it well. So you can say, yes, we make plastics, but we also, we make, we tend to make the lightweight, high performance plastics you use in automobiles instead of, um, instead of steel to make them uh, more fuel efficient or we made we invented water-based coatings for cars um, and we have plastic additives that make greenhouses last longer. So we have all this sort of the magic of chemistry um, where we try to bring sustainability into the conversation. Does that mean we don't make plastics? No, of course we do. We make all sorts of 60,000 products, right? <laughs> we make lots of things. <laughs> Um, but we recognize that our specialty is materials and we can try to make the materials more sustainable, but it doesn't work unless the whole system is sustainable. And, and that's in part why we helped to found this new Alliance to End Plastic Waste, which was recently set up in Singapore as a nonprofit organization funded mostly by, by big businesses um, and also with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development because they're doing the systems piece. Um, they focus on infrastructure, innovation, education, and cleanup. And they're working with everyone from the waste pickers, to the municipal governments, to the local entrepreneurs, to the UN, um, and trying to set up cir small circular systems um, to capture waste and, and, and create value from it um, in the parts of the world where plastic waste leakage is the highest. So the places with the biggest problems, 
that's where they're focusing their money. Um, the goal is to mobilize 1.5 billion US dollars over five years. I think we're gonna overshoot that, both in the number of, of, of dollars and in the number of years. I expect this problem may not be solved in five years. It may take us a little bit longer, um, but we really feel like it's gotta be a holistic approach and, and it's a nice complement to what we're trying to do. Yeah, I'm getting a number of questions and uh, I will take them at the end um, and I will address then the, the panelists uh, accordingly. Uh, Olivia, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Sure. Um, Olivia, um, how, how does circularity fit into Pernod Ricard's uh, sustainability strategy? Sure, thanks for the question, Corrado. So I think taking on from um, Rachel's point and emphasis around value chains, um, in April of last year, the group launched its 2030 SNR roadmap that really articulates a long-term vision touching every part of our business from grain to glass and really involves everyone in the business and across our value chain. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it represents or it, um, it articulates uh, four key commitments or what we call four key pillars across all material issues of the business. So we've got nurturing terroir or nurturing our land and agriculture, valuing our people, circular making, and finally responsible hosting. Um, this roadmap is supported by key targets and some of them are science-based to ensure that we have robust measuring um, and uh, monitoring. And most critically, and to the points made earlier around this being a collective challenge and a journey we need to take together, we very much embedded in our strategy, um, the UN SDGs. If we take a closer look at pillar, our pillar three on circular economy, um, I think in building this pillar and the commitments we, or actions and commitments that we've, we've put into this pillar, we really recognize that we share a world of very finite resources that are currently under huge and increasing pressure. What we look to do as a company and as a group is just to minimize that waste at every step by really reimagining, um, producing and distributing our products and experiences in a different way that optimize and help preserve uh, natural resources. So if we look at the pillar on circular economy, we've made ambitious commitments to reduce by 50% the overall intensity of our carbon footprint by 2030. Um, we're looking to be 100% water balanced um, in high risk countries where we operate and produce by 2030. And then if I take a closer look at the topic of packaging, which resonates in this discussion, um, packaging is a fundamental part of our business. Um, it actually contributes to a significant 30% of our overall uh, carbon footprint. So when we look at specifically the commitments we're making, um, today uh, our CEO and Chairman Alexander Ricard announced that we would be ending all single-use plastic point of sale by next year, um, as opposed to our original target of ending it by 2025. So really an ambitious aim there. Um, we are also proud to be a signatory of the Alan MacArthur Foundation New Plastics Economy, uh, we're looking at how to make 100% of our packaging recyclable, compostable, reusable, and biosourced. And we're also looking to pilot new circular ways of distributing our wine and spirits. If I then just end and give just a practical example of what some of our uh, brands are doing, just to um, make it more tangible to the audience, um, we, uh, our Campo Viejo wine, uh, the bottle weight has been reduced by 30%. Uh, if we take our Jameson whiskey bottles, um, they're now made of 80% recycled glass content. So already mm -hmm. we're taking great strides to meet those commitments. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, and um, thinking a little bit about Pernod Ricard and the complexity of your supply chain and, and operation, because you are truly global. Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, now hearing all those targets and ambitions and commitment that you have on circular economy, what, what are the challenges and difficulties that you are experiencing in implementing it in Southeast Asia? So if we're taking a bit the Asian uh, approach, can you, can you share some of your, yeah. Uh, sure. Thank you. I think thank in you. general terms, obviously we're, we're, we're dealing with quite an um, a diverse region, um, especially in ASEAN. Um, we have markets like Singapore that are very much advanced in their legislation, their regulation, and their tangible uh, practices, as well as their collaboration with industry. And then we're working with more emerging markets where all of this is quite new 
And of course, there, there's a need to see how we can best support governments um, in that regard. So I think for us, usually, um, it's sometimes a challenge to, to deliver um, or move towards those ambitious commitments when we're looking at diverse markets. Um, and also ultimately um, trying to convince governments that this is a collective effort to strengthen a circular economy approach and, and also collective effort to achieve that zero waste society. I mean, just to point out a few sort of general um, streams of challenges that we have observed. Um, sometimes the lack of clarity related to the responsibility and the accountability around things like recycling. Um, sometimes there's a challenge around the actual infrastructure to be able to recycle. We sometimes um, observe that um, certain legislation around uh, recycling can be used as a form of discrimination and barrier to trade. Uh, and also sometimes there's not sufficient research um, and demonstration on the ground of the importance of recycling. And therefore that doesn't help close the loop in terms of showing to governments that uh, this is an, an important part of the agenda. Thank you. So uh, we actually having a number of questions. So I will try to address some of those. Um, and since we are on the Asian, and I'm opening now for the discussion among the panelists, uh, how can circularity help Asian meet its Paris Agreement targets? Um, so I don't know if if um, if if either uh, Emmanuel or Wichang you want to uh, to uh, comment on this. So how can the circularity help Asian meet its Paris Agreement targets? Well, for Singapore's context, um, and uh, if we have uh, sustainable consumption production as well as resource management, we are actually reducing the amount of um, um, movement of materials that you need to ship in if you have a circular economy going on in Singapore. So by having some of these reductions, you're actually reducing the emissions of carbon going up into the atmosphere. So in that essence, uh, I see that there can be some um, uh, uh, contribution in how we can meet the, the Paris Agreement in that aspect. Yeah. Then of course, uh, for the ASEAN context, you know, after we've uh, got our models uh, in place, we're happy to share with our neighbors. Uh, we are quite connected with most of the, our ASEAN counterparts. Yeah. Emmanuel, um, I, I think since, since during, during your, your intervention, we, we, we spoke about practical assistance from Europe to, to Asia. And there is a question on, on possible suggestion to policymakers in Asia, uh, and spe specifically in Asian countries, to support more technology-driven investment. Um, any, any, any view, Emmanuel, on, on, uh, on this? So any, any practical suggestion to policymaker in Asia on, uh, on supporting more technology-driven investment and manufacturing, so, so actually the customers will be able to afford more uh, innovative products? I, th I think that this is precisely what we try to, to build uh, through um, policy dialogue. So uh, we have uh, had the, the first uh, high level policy dialogue um, last year. And then through what I was explaining about the circular economy missions, where it's not only about the policy makers, but it's really um, the partnership between uh, businesses, policymakers, and, and NGOs, and I think this is very important. Um, I'm not aware of specific uh, discussion on the um, uh, technology side. Uh, we have a quite broad uh, agenda uh, on the uh, cooperation uh, in the context of the um, high-level dialogue. I think that maybe my colleagues in, uh, in the delegation um, would be best placed to answer this specific question. Yeah, we will ask them later on then, Emmanuel. Uh, then, then actually it's a bit uh, uh, a provoking question to Rachel and Olivia. Um, the question is actually interesting because it's basically asking whether implementing specific taxes or, or exercising uh, to product based on, on, on externalities, whether that will help having less waste, uh, higher customer awareness, and government income. 
So Rachel and Olivia, you think you think there is a point here? Uh, will will higher taxes uh, drive circularity? Yeah, to see if my lawyers are watching. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think the answer, like to many of these questions, is that depends. Um, and, and what we like to see is that that the whole economic analysis is done, um, and the whole environmental analysis is done. So looking at all the impacts. Um, certainly, when you look at things like waste charging in a society, that's a great incentive for people to start paying attention to the bulk of their waste and looking at ways on an individual household level um, to reduce, absolutely. When, when blanket taxes are put on goods that, that in a globalized economy, often there's um, unintended consequences um, that prevent, for instance, certain kinds of goods being shipped over borders and then reprocessed. So we find, as, as Olivia mentioned, some barriers to trade sometimes where we're looking at materials that are post-consumer or, or pre-consumer being being labeled as waste and then therefore not being allowed over barriers, uh, over boundaries rather, or, or borders. Um, and therefore, we can't make the best use of them from a circular economy perspective. So I think it's, it's really important to do the econometric homework um, before you ask that question. <laughs> And, and then also be aware that you know you can be a victim of politics because unfortunately politics happens as I'm sure Emmanuel can attest. Yeah, yeah so a, a bit of following questions on 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 that. How, how can we actually from from the private and, and public, since we agree that this is a journey, a collaborative journey, how, how can we actually make sure that we find few and stand, standard or universally accepted standard to measure uh, our progresses? Is, is there in, in any way a collaborative effort to find uh, a baseline that can even be independently audited by trusted third parties, for example, right? So that you create that trust and comfort. So how to make sure that, that we can actually find those few and universally applicable standards? What kind of collaboration will we hire between public and private to make that happen? Well, maybe it can... Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> All right. So from uh, our perspective, we also uh, we partner our industries when we create standards. And uh, not only do we partner our industry to create local standards, we are also partnering international standard organizations to align some of these standards. So these are some of the uh, work that we are uh, uh, trying so that we can actually facilitate our export and import of our goods and materials. So in terms of standards, uh, we, because as a government, we can set a standard, but we need the industry's input, what works for them, so that uh, their businesses are not impacted or their businesses can be actually augmented by some of these standards. So with that collaboration internally within Singapore, we are then look at uh, collaborating with other international organizations to harmonize some of these standards so that our industries are able to then connect with other industries out there. Yeah. Thank you. You want to add something else, Emmanuel? Yes. I, I think it depends also what uh, we are talking about. So in the European Union, what we have uh, tried to do is to see um, how we are moving as an economy uh, towards a circular economy. And so back in 2018, uh, we have created a so-called um, monitoring framework uh, on the circular economy uh, that look at a number of um, European statistics, uh, which we have, uh, for example, in terms of um, uh, job uh, creation or in terms of uh, uh, waste uh, generation and uh, we are able to uh, check these um, indicators uh, through uh, a website and see the progression. In, in this context we had a lot of um, um, a lot of references to uh, waste because we have been building the monitoring framework uh, on the basis mostly of um, statistical data we, we had. And we see that we will need to invest much more uh, to look at the um, uh, production and consumption uh, size, uh, side. 
And there I see also a big, so we will need to continue teaming up with uh, statisticians, but at some point we also need to link this um, data uh, to, uh, the, uh, to, the, to the products and to the exchange in, in products. So I would, I would say there is the monitoring of the circular economy at EU level um, at large. And then uh, there is the question of uh, standards on some standards and, and methods, for example, for, um, for products. And this will um, uh, require a lot of attention uh, from the European Commission, member states, uh, industries, businesses in the coming years. Uh, we see that there are many methods to calculate uh, the life cycle um, impacts of uh, products, goods and services, and maybe probably too many methods, um, misleading ones sometimes. So this will, the, the metrics aspect will be extremely important in the forthcoming years. Yeah. Um, Olivia and Rachel, would you be welcoming uh, any type of regulated assessment and certification process? Would, would it be something that, that you would be welcoming as a, as a private sector? Um, well, uh, perhaps I can step in here um, and uh, Rachel, please do come in. I, I mean, as Perner Recard, we do um, adhere to certain certifications, so we're part of RU100. Um, around sort of renewable energy. So I think definitely certification and, and um, regulation provides a robust framework, um, not just in terms of standards and monitoring, but also in terms of that end goal. So where are we heading to? And how can we frame that within those certifications and um, that set of regulation? Rachel, you have yeah, anything to add? I, I agree, actually. We're, we're, we're big proponents of, uh, of externally validated and, and certified uh, standards. Um, we've invented a couple of BSF that have ended up at, SO, at ISO. Um, and the one, one that we're working on right now that we are proposing for, for government and, and market adoption that's particularly germane to the circular economy is mass balance. So looking at, for instance, that you allocate a certain amount of, of sustainable uh, waste, sustainable food waste or sustainable cooking oil into a production process and that's certified in, in, in Germany by Tuvesud and then that comes out at the other end as part of a product and that product can be labeled bio-based even though the molecules were actually mixed with some non-bio-based mo molecules during the production process. So this mass balance allocation, like what's done for renewable energy and an energy mixed energy scenario today, it's a transition strategy until there's enough market demand for fully bio-based products or fully chemical recycled products, but allows you to start feeding in these lower carbon, higher circularity feedstocks uh, into your existing uh, efficient, large efficient production processes and gain market understanding of how that works and, and product quality. So we're, we're working um, assiduously to try to get that idea accepted and validated and, and certified. Yeah, and it, it is, of course, important, as, as pointed by one of the attendees, that we will the small, medium-sized enterprises and in order to make it affordable to, to them as well, right? That we are not putting too many certification requirements and alike that they will have to, you know, uh, bear as a SME. So I think this is also something that we need to to remember. Um, on the plastic side, I, I get a few questions on the plastic side. Um, interesting enough, um, if, I, if I can take one, is actually um, also thinking about the COVID-19 and what Olivia mentioned on, 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 on uh, reducing or eliminating the single use of plastic. Um, so the, the Asian experience with plastic recycling has not been that positive. Uh, so how, how can and will circular economy actually overcome such a negative experience? So generally, uh, that's one question, but I can combine it with a few others. Um, is circular economy a way of countering the negative perception of, of uh, globalization in, in, in a way that we can actually improve on a number of metrics? Open questions to you. So whether, whether 
uh, how how to how to uh, use circular economy to uh, help changing the negative uh, um, assessment that we have about plastic uh, and thereby as well whether COVID uh, will actually increase the plastic consumption going forward um, and, and generally and then we will have to conclude whether circular economy is actually a good way to spark a new energy in creating confidence that globally we can still collaborate and we don't need to look into regional small circular economies uh, working uh, and, and living their own standalone life. Um, Corrado, perhaps I could just start and um, say that uh, essentially the circular economy approach makes us uh, adopt a circular mindset and with a circular mindset um, and a circular economy approach we really um, recognize the interdependency that we have with each other because it's circular. So I think that spurs a level of cooperation and collaboration and working together, which I think has been emphasized by a lot of panelists today. So I think that notion of shifting into circularity and shifting into collaboration, circles of collaboration, really shifts the narrative around the negative perception that we currently have or dialogue to something uh, more positive because it requires us to work together. Now, just to give a very practical example in, in Europe, and it doesn't reference plastic per se, but it could be transferable. Um, as part of the Trade Association Spirits Europe, uh, we've become a partner of the Close the, the Glass Initiative. And basically it unites the whole packaging value chain under a multi-stakeholder European program which also supports national level action plans. So there is a really good example of a sort of circular and um, collaborative approach. And I think that's what we'll increasingly see, not just at a national level, but at a regional and a global level. Thank you, Olivia. So basically, it, it, we, we don't need to think local or regional. We still have to keep a global approach uh, in order to make this uh, collaborative effort and stewardship and mindset to 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 thrive and foster, um, I will take uh, any 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 other comments. Yeah, maybe maybe I think that the the example of um, of plastic has been also a good uh, illustration of uh, how we can um, act uh, together at at global level. Um, I think that when the European Union issued the, the plastic strategy uh, back in 2018 and then proposed a, a single use plastic um, directive that was adopted in record time by the uh, member states of the European Union and, and the European Parliament, there has been a huge uh, interest from uh, partner countries and also from the global uh, community that uh, met at the uh, UN uh, Environmental uh, Assembly and passed a number of resolutions uh, on, um, on plastics. So I think this is really uh, a way to illustrate how if we can uh, design a strategy, explain what is at stake, uh, team up, uh, we, we can share a lot of, um, of knowledge. And this will be uh, even more indispensable after uh, the corona crisis. I mean, we are still in the middle of, uh, of a very difficult sanitary uh, situation, economic situation, social. There will be a lot of um, uh, requests uh, regarding uh, enhancing the resilience of each um, you know, single economy. Uh, not to be so dependent uh, upon others. And so unless we are able to uh, innovate also across uh, value chains to demonstrate that they are solid, uh, they are uh, environmentally sound, that they are circular, that we can trace product, we know what we do, uh, it, will, it will, could be a big uh, challenge. Yeah. Thank you, so, Emmanuel. If, if there is one thing I would wish for right now from a circular economy perspective that I could uh, that we could reuse the hour. 
<laughs> and uh, <laughs> because because there is so much more that we can we can discuss. Uh, let me let me try to wrap up some of our our um, conversation, and then we will close the webinar. Um, we started saying that circular economy for Asian uh, and advancing, we, we agreed that this is something in the making. So it's something that is not made, it's something that we all uh, can participate and contribute to. Uh, it will require a collaborative effort uh, in making sure that both the public as well as the private, they are finding a common ground in order to uh, not only have some ambition uh, in, in how to innovate and design and, and be smart, but also in how to measure. Um, because what, what get measured get monitored and, and thereby it, it, can be, it can be used uh, as, a, as a way of progressing. Um, yeah. I would like to ask uh, Emmanuel, uh, Wei Chong, Rachel and Olivia, your last you know, two words about you started uh, I started asking you what circular economy is all about. Can I ask you to end up sharing your sense? Where are we today? And I will already now thank you for your participation. I will thank all the attendees uh, because once Olivia has shared her thoughts, we will close the webinar. So Emmanuel, if I can start with you again, what's your feeling? Where are we in terms of circularity? from one to 10? Oh, we are still at the, at the very uh, beginning of that uh, systemic uh, change. Um, for the moment at uh, the European Union level, we have this uh, new uh, circular economy action plan that has been presented in March. All the member states of the European Union, stakeholders and the European Parliament are reviewing it. So we are looking forward to their views, to check if we are on the right uh, track for the strategy ahead. And if we are, then we will be uh, delivering a number of uh, specific uh, proposals on, for example, products, but also on empowering consumers, as I was telling you. This obviously is largely dependent upon um, the uh, situation we are in. And the Commission has been uh, asked to provide for a recovery uh, plan, so in coordination uh, at EU level in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, so I think it will be very important uh, to watch that uh, space as well at EU level and to continue the, um, the, co the cooperation with uh, ASEAN. So I, I hope that we can count on the Business uh, Council on uh, companies to reflect further because you can be a, a bridge to make sure that these value chains uh, function in a better way uh, towards uh, circular economy. Thank you. Wei Chong. So for, for us, we are also embarking on our journey towards uh, being a zero waste nation with a circular economy approach. And uh, we will be enacting, uh, we have enacted bills to look at enhance producer responsibilities so that will also help drive our circular economy uh, approach and it will focus on electronic waste, food waste and plastic waste. So we are in uh, on the lookout for solutions perhaps from uh, EU Asian Business Council, some of your members, you know, for, to come up with some solutions to help us to close our plastic loops. Something that could uh, convert your bottles or your, your uh, you know, LDPE films in the waste to something that's usable for our petrochemical industries, for example, maybe through chemical recycling. And even for our bottom ash that goes to our landfill, we need to look at ways that we can change this to even construction material. So we are on the lookout for And uh, a better place, one place that I could think of for a network like this could be maybe next year when we do our Clean Environment Summit Singapore, we welcome all of you to come and uh, to, we can continue this conversation there. Thank you. Rachel. Um, so I think on, on a scale of one to 10, we're maybe at two and putting on our <laughs> running shoes, but still scratching our heads at the same time. Um, from an industry perspective, I think we're working on actually some of those problems that, that, that Wei, uh, Wei Chung had just mentioned, um, including chemical recycling and, and, and uh, better plastic additives to allow more recycling of, the, of existing plastic. Um, and I think working with governments and getting governments 
support to set up the systems to, to, to value and collect and sort and reprocess. Um, I think, and, and with the help of digitalization and, and 3D printing, I think we can actually really speed up this, this process. So I'm quite optimistic. Thank you. And you actually replied another question. So thank you for that as well. <laughs> that, that technology and, and uh, data and artificial intelligence are actually very helpful in, in terms of circularity. Um, Olivia. Sure, thank you. Um, so I, I'd probably say that um, I think from, from the perspective of what's happened also in the current crisis, really um, this is an opportunity to, to really speed up um, at a global level our commitments around SNR through a circular economy approach. It's a journey, we're at different stages. Um, some of it's at the very beginning, some of it's at the middle. Um, but I think there's a, there's a recognition at industry and I think at government level that there's an opportunity for deeper transformation and we have an approach to be able to, to sort of reach that goal and ensure that um, we really uh, preserve the nature and um, the earth that we're, you know, that we're currently in so that it's there for the long term. Thank you. So once again, everyone, uh, before handing over to Chris, I will just apologize for the ones that we didn't, uh, we were not able to attend you in terms of questions, but a thousand thanks for asking so many questions. Uh, Chris, over to you. Thanks, Gerardo. Thank you to, to you for moderating so brilliantly well. Thank you to Emmanuel, White, John, Rachel, and Olivia for your insights as well. It was a very enjoyable di discussion. Uh, and indeed, I think as Rachel mentioned earlier on, we are working at the Business Council on, a, on an advocacy paper on the circular economy, which I hope will be out before the end of June. So no pressure on my members there in terms of their contributions <laughs> to it. <laughs> uh, all it leads me to say is, again, thank you very much. Thank you for all the attendees for staying with us throughout this. We have another webinar in our sustainability series next week on sustainable infrastructure in Southeast Asia which will be moderated by our Vice Chairman, Martin Hayes. We have Johan de Villiers from ABB on that. We have a rep from Infrastructure Asia and from Here Technologies, and also uh, Igor Dreisman, who's the uh, EU Ambassador to ASEAN, who will be joining us for that one. So please do tune in for that. Sign up for it if you haven't done so already. And with that, I wish you all a very pleasant weekend. Stay safe, stay at home, and look after yourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.